Thank you for joining this presentation today with Castle Biosciences. My name is Matthew Goldberg. I'm medical director here at Castle, and I'm joined by my colleague Bob Cook, who's senior vice president of research and development at Castle. Today, we're going to be talking about diagnostic and prognostic testing in melanocytic lesions, and we'll be discussing uh, two tests: the Decision DX, Diff DX melanoma, and Decision DX melanoma test that taken together represent molecular diagnostic and prognostic solutions for patients with difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesions, as well as invasive cutaneous melanoma. The DIF-DX melanoma test is fundamentally designed to add diagnostic clarity and confidence for dermatopathologists while helping dermatologists deliver more informed patient management plans when confronted with difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesions. The Decision DX melanoma test is for patients with invasive cutaneous melanoma and helps to inform important clinical management decisions uh, for the benefit of patient care. The, at Kessel Biosciences, there's a robust development uh, pipeline for these gene expression profile tests. And it begins with a tissue of interest. In the case of these two tests, a difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesion or invasive cutaneous melanoma, respectively. And a clinician will place an, uh, an order for, this, uh, for these gene expression profile tests and the gene expression profile is fundamentally based on analysis of formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded tissue. This tissue is macrodissected, and then RT-PCR is performed from that tissue. Um, and after that step, the gene expression profile test, the proprietary algorithm um, that's developed through AI technology, really helps to produce um, discrete scores that provide information about diagnostic information or prognostic information to inform clinical management decisions for the benefit of the patients who receive these tests. So first on the Decision DX, Diff DX melanoma test, which again is focused on the difficult to diagnose melanocytic neoplasms. And in the United States, we estimate that there are approximately 2 million biopsies that are performed each year by dermatologists for patients who come in with suspicious pigmented lesions. And as the result of these biopsies, there are approximately 130,000 invasive cutaneous melanomas and almost 100,000 melanoma in situs that are diagnosed per year. Um, however, many lesions, we estimate about 300,000, can't be confidently diagnosed using the diagnostic tools that dermatopathologists have um, access to uh, today. And really this test, the DIF-DX melanoma test, is focused on these areas of diagnostic uncertainty um, for these difficult to diagnose melanocytic skin lesions. And Discordance in pathology interpretations is a significant uh, challenge for melanocytic neoplasia. And in this schematic here for the MPATH DX system from a paper published in 2017, I think it highlights the impact of both inter observer discordance or discordance between pathologists, as well as intra observer discordance from the same pathologist looking at the same slide at different time points. And there can be a variation in interpretation for the same lesion. And what's more, that this uh, variability or discordance is greatest in the uh, difficult to diagnose or kind of middle zone, not, not on the poles of, of straightforward benign cases seen here in class one or the very malignant cases seen here in class five, but really the amount of discordance is greatest in this middle zone uh, where here the inter-observer concordance ranges from 25% uh, to 46% concordance in this class two to class four zone. So I think this speaks to the unmet clinical need for uh, a test that can provide objective information to help identify whether a lesion is benign or malignant, whether it represents a nevus uh, or a melanoma um, for these difficult to diagnose melanocytic skin lesions. And fundamentally, a definitive diagnosis really helps to inform patient management decisions for patients with cutaneous melanocytic neoplasms. So we start on the left with the 2 million biopsies that we estimate coming from dermatology practices yearly. And on the bottom row, the benign diagnoses that can be confidently diagnosed by dermatopathology, those patients don't require additional treatment and they can return to their routine follow-up with their primary care clinicians and dermatologists. On the upper end here, seen in red, the definitive diagnoses of melanoma or melanoma in situ all result in a wide local excision of the lesion in question, depending on the, on the characteristics of the tumor. Uh, after that time, other decisions must be made, such as the performance of a sentinel lymph node biopsy, decisions around uh, whether imaging should be obtained, and interval for follow-up after diagnosis, as well as the need for gene expression profile testing, depending on the characteristics of the primary tumor. The focus of the DIF-DX test, however, is seen here in the orange zone for the lesions in between with the uncertain malignant potential. And what happens in current clinical practice today is that often these lesions are treated to the worst case scenario of their differential diagnosis, which can lead to significant uh, 
overtreatment potentially of lesions that don't require additional um, surgery, wide local excision, or other interventions, and potentially uh, underdiagnosis so that a lesion that um, should be best classified as a malignant lesion might not be identified at an early time point, which could have untoward outcomes uh, for patients whose lesions go untreated for a longer period of time. So accurate diagnosis could be very impactful um, for both avoiding unnecessary interventions as well as early diagnosis of patients with concerning melanocytic neoplasia. Here's a schematic for the workflow of how uh, biopsies of melanocytic skin lesions move through a derm path office. So many cases are evaluated initially by a dermatopathologist and can be right away identified as benign or malignant just with review of H&E slides. And dermatopathologists have a range of tools in all labs, immunohistochemical stains, access to deeper levels, uh, bringing a slide to a trusted colleague or to a, a standard consensus conference with a group of dermatopathologists to really help review cases and to then subsequently identify cases as benign or malignant in that context. However, despite those steps, there remain a significant subset of lesions where the diagnosis remains equivocal um, or ambiguous. And for these, there are other tests that are currently available. We call them ancillary tests that could include fluorescence in situ hybridization, FISH, uh, comparative genomic hybridization, CGH, or uh, gene expression profile testing, GEP, that can be used in this uh, subset of lesions um, to help get a specific diagnosis. Second opinion is also a, a very commonly used option where slides are sent to a regional or national expert uh, to gain additional information uh, about the lesion in question. And fundamentally, DIFDX melanoma is focused on this, this level of uncertainty for cases that are currently difficult to diagnose and classify as benign or malignant. And so the intended use statement here for the DIFDX melanoma tests is a gene expression profile test for the in vitro analysis of these primary cutaneous melanocytic lesions for which the malignant potential is uncertain. And as an ancillary test, it helps to characterize these lesions as benign or malignant and must be interpreted in the context of the other clinical, laboratory, and histopathologic information that clinicians have at hand when working to incorporate the gene expression profile information um, into patient management decisions. So the DIFDX melanoma test is fundamentally designed to differentiate between benign and malignant melanocytic neoplasms where malignant potential is uncertain. And it does so with uh, a proprietary 35 gene expression profile that's again performed uh, with RT-PCR on this macro-dissected tissue from formalin-fixed paraffin-embedded samples. And it, this algorithm uh, that comprises the gene expression profile test um, it effectively classifies the lesions as benign or with a gene expression profile suggestive of a benign neoplasm, intermediate risk with a gene expression profile where malignancy can't be excluded, or malignant, which is a gene expression profile suggestive of melanoma. The evidence that supports the clinical validity and clinical utility of this test has been published recently um, in the manuscript seen here with the development and clinical validation from Estrada et al. and the clinical utility from Farberg et al., both published um, in 2020 in the Journal of Skin, Skin, the Journal of Cutaneous Medicine. For the next section of the, this talk, I'm going to be uh, going through the development and validation data um, in a bit more detail. And fundamentally, the effort started with 1,300 benign nevi and 1,500 malignant melanomas that were randomly selected into a study cohort of 951 cases. Uh, these cases were again separated out into a training cohort, uh, 416 cases, and a validation cohort of an independent set of 503 cases um, seen here at the bottom. The one thing I want to call attention to is the rate of MGF or multiple gene failure. And there are 32 cases in the cohort of 951 from the entire study cohort that were not able to be resulted uh, through the gene expression profile test, which represents a high rate of technical success with over 96% of cases uh, that were included in the study cohort producing a result with the gene expression profile test. And that rate is in line with uh, the gene expression profile test uh, technical success that CASEL has for other clinically available products and what we anticipate um, for clinical testing with a high rate um, of technical success for difficult to diagnose melanocytic skin lesions. I'll first focus on the training cohort and then move on to the validation cohort here in these next slides. So for the training, it begin, the, the effort really began with a set of uh, archival benign and malignant samples that had concordant diagnoses with 200 benign nevi and 216 malignant melanomas. 
RT-PCR was again performed on these tissues. Um, and for the discovery step, there were 76 genes that were included. And as, re as a result of deep learning techniques and neural network modeling, uh, a 35 gene expression profile algorithm was locked that contained 32 discriminant genes and three control genes. The signature was then validated on an independent cohort of 503 cases um, that comprised the validation cohort. So the training set of 416 cases included uh, a range of benign nevus subtypes and melanoma subtypes seen here. And they include uh, commonly encountered subtypes um, of melanoma, such as superficial spreading or nodular melanomas, as well as less common uh, variants such as spitzoid melanoma, nevoid melanoma, and desmoplastic melanoma, and importantly included melanoma in situ uh, as well in the development effort. And again, for the training cohort, this is where the deep learning and neural networks were applied to reduce the 76 genes that were investigated to a 35 gene expression profile signature seen here. Onto the clinical validation here. Again, this is from an independent cohort of 503 cases comprised of 273 benign nevi and 230 malignant melanoma. And the subtypes of the benign nevi and malignant melanomas are the same as were present in the training set. Um, the numbers are, are different, again, because this is an, uh, an independent cohort, but the subtypes remain the same, including a, a range of benign and malignant subtypes. Included here uh, with these benign lesions were uh, lesions that had three out of three diagnostic concordance in the vast majority of cases, as well as two out of three diagnostic concordance from independent dermatopathologists that had, that speaks to the ability of this test to accurately identify lesions as benign or malignant in this validation set um, with both levels of diagnostic concordance, which is beneficial for where this test will be applied in lesions where there is significant uh, diagnostic uncertainty. Moving on to the performance metrics overall, seen here in the middle column is the performance for the test in the entire 503 patient cohort of the validation, as well as the adult population, the over 18 population with 478 lesions. And I'll focus on, on the over 18 adult population here as the test will be clinically available only for adults at this time. The sensitivity and specificity of the test in the validation was 99.1% and 96.2% respectively, which speaks to the high positive predictive value and negative predictive value uh, seen in this cohort. And importantly, these statistics were calculated with only 3.8% of the intermediate risk lesions uh, removed. And this is a, a high level of um, over 96% of cases that receive an actionable result from the decision DX, diff DX melanoma test with a high level of accuracy with the test able to differentiate between lesions that were malignant melanoma and benign nevi using the gene expression profile test. The performance by subtype of benign nevus and melanoma are included in the Estrada et al. manuscript. I'd refer you to the manuscript to see the breakdown of the performance by subtype of nevus and melanoma. So again, I want to position the decision DX, diff DX melanoma test within the workflow for melanocytic lesions uh, within dermatopathology. So again, the test is, is not intended for lesions that are straightforward and easy to diagnose today uh, with H&E uh, slides or uh, immunohistochemical tools or consensus opinion within a dermatopathology lab. It's positioned here off to the right uh, in, the, in this area where we have ancillary diagnostic tools to aid in the diagnosis for ambiguous or equivocal um, lesions where they can be very challenging to accurately identify a benign and malignant lesion and where this gene expression profile test can add significant diagnostic clarity. And again, this is decision DX, diff DX melanoma's purpose to add this diagnostic clarity and confidence for dermatopathologists who are evaluating these difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesions, and then in turn, help the dermatologists who receive the result um, to help inform uh, their patient management plans that can be based on the biology of the um, difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesion itself. And the decision DX melanoma test is positioned here as if the diagnosis changes from a difficult to diagnose or equivocal melanocytic lesion to an invasive cutaneous melanoma, um, and it is appropriate for testing with the decision DX melanoma test, the second test can be ordered uh, with a tissue sparing approach um, that is a benefit for patients and clinicians as the decision DX melanoma test can be used to inform important patient management decisions based on the prognostic information that my colleague, 
Bob Cook will discuss uh, in his review of the decision DX melanoma. And so essentially, the diff DX melanoma test is positioned for these difficult to diagnose melanocytic lesions, and the decision DX melanoma test is positioned for the prognostic information for invasive cutaneous melanoma, which will be the, the focus of the second half of the presentation. And with that, I'll pass to uh, Bob Cook. Thank you, Dr. Goldberg. Let's begin today by revisiting one of the clinical hurdles faced by melanoma patients today. Uh, while 92% of the patients diagnosed with stage one, stage two, or stage three disease are lower risk stage one and stage two patients, we know that 60% of the patients who die from melanoma each year uh, fall into the stage one and stage two categories. This signifies a, um, a, a misclassification by the staging only approach uh, used today, and also begs for better prognostic tools as we move forward in the management of melanoma patients. The Decision DX melanoma test was designed to really inform two important clinical decisions uh, that impact treatment uh, of, melanoma, of melanoma patients. So for those diagnosed with localized cutaneous melanoma, the Decision DX melanoma, melanoma test can inform the question of risk for positive sentinel lymph node uh, outcomes, and also the risk for recurrence within five years of the diagnosis of melanoma. By improving the accuracy of risk prediction, we can better guide uh, patients to low or high risk management uh, plans outlined by national guidelines. So the Decision DX melanoma test was designed for patients with stage one to three melanoma. And it quantifies the expression of 31 genes from the primary tumor. It applies the expression of those, th those prognostic genes to the um, validated algorithm that can accurately classify patients as having low class one risk or high class two risk. Class one and class two are further subdivided to uh, subclassifications with class 1A representing the lowest risk patient population and class 2B representing the highest risk population. Many of the analyses that we we'll discuss today and results that we discuss today will focus on the comparison of, state of uh, class 1A versus class 2B patients. Overall, there's a robust body of evidence supporting the use of the Decision DX melanoma test and its analytic validity, clinical validity, and clinical utility for guiding patient management decisions uh, ranging from sentinel lymph node biopsy to referral to surgical or medical oncology. So let's first look at the, uh, the, the first of the two clinical decisions impacted by Decision DX melanoma that of identifying which patients are at a higher or lower risk for sentinel lymph node metastases. For this risk prediction, the Decision DX melanoma test can be combined with tumor thickness and age to provide an accurate risk assessment. As we know, uh, current guidelines recommend that sentinel lymph node biopsy is uh, considered for patients with an expected risk of having a sentinel lymph node positive outcome above 5%. This 5% threshold was determined as part of the multi-center selective lymphadenectomy trial. Um, and the use of this threshold really results in an overall rate of sentinel lymph node positivity of around 12%. What this means is that 88% of patients who undergo the sentinel lymph node surgical procedure will have a negative result and really there's an opportunity uh, for us to better identify patients who are likely to have positive sentinel lymph node and improve, improve the yield of patients uh, who undergo the sentinel lymph node procedure. We reported uh, two years ago the utility of the Decision DX melanoma test in combination with T-stage and age for identifying patients who are at low risk for having sentinel lymph node metastases. We combined those 1,421 patients in that prospective study 
with a second prospective cohort of 1,690 patients to have a, a larger cohort of 3,093 patients in total. Within those 3,093 patients, we had over 2,000 T1 and T2 melanomas in which we were able to identify that those with a class 1A result had a very low rate below the national guideline recommendation of 5% uh, for sentinel lymph node positivity. What this means is that we're able to identify a population of patients with a very low risk of sentinel lymph node positive outcome, similar to stage T1A patients, T stage 1A patients, uh, for whom the sentinel lymph node biopsy is not recommended. By comparison, uh, we can also identify higher risk patients, and in particular, in the red box uh, at the bottom of the table, we can see that class 2B patients have a very high risk of well above 10% for sentinel lymph node positivity, meaning that these patients align with, with a group that is recommended to have a sentinel lymph node biopsy offered to them. Shifting gears to the second utility of the Decision DX melanoma test, uh, or identifying those patients who are at high risk for recurrence of, of either regional or distant metastasis within five years of diagnosis, the Decision DX melanoma test can be combined with staging in order to better stratify low risk and high risk patient groups. A large body of evidence supports the validity of the, the Decision DX melanoma test uh, for this purpose. Both archival and prospective studies have been published, as well as single, single and multi-center studies. On this slide, you can see that the majority of the studies uh, represented show a very significant separation of risk between class one and class two patients. And I'll draw your attention to the bottom left of the screen where we can see an even broader separation of risk between subclass 1A and subclass 2B patients. And for the remainder of the discussion, I'll focus on these uh, subclasses of 1A and 2B as the lowest and highest risk groups. So if we look at um, the utility of the Decision DX melanoma test and the validity of the test within each AJCC stage, stage one, stage two, and stage three. We can see that the black dots on the slide represent the AJCC melanoma specific survival rates within each of these stage groups. With stage one patients having a very low risk, um, aligning with the low risk NCCN category shown on the right, Stage two and stage three overall have high risk aligning with high risk uh, by, NCCN, uh, by NCCN category. If we utilize the Decision DX melanoma test within each of these stage groups, we can see that those patients with a stage two B, a class 2B outcome have a very low uh, survival rate compared to those with class 1A outcome. And so overall, a patient with a stage 2B outcome aligns with the high risk NCCN group and may warrant more intense management uh, opportunities, whereas the class 1A patients align with the low risk NCCN group. One of the critical pieces of evidence supporting the Decision DX melanoma test was a systematic review and meta-analysis published in the Journal of, Amer of the American Academy of Dermatology in 2020. This meta-analysis included 1,479 patients from four independent cohorts. Overall, within the entire cohort of 1,479 patients, we can see that for the endpoints of recurrence-free survival and distant metastasis-free survival, the gene expression profile separated risk uh, significantly with class 1A patients having five-year RFS or recurrence-free survival of 91% compared to 44% for class 2B patients and five-year distant metastasis-free survival or DMF 
a DMFS for class one patients of 94% compared to 56% for class 2B patients. Importantly, when comparing the Decision DX melanoma test uh, to staging factors and age in a Cox multivariate analysis, we saw for both of those endpoints of RFS and DMFS that the gene expression profile was a very significant uh, and independent factor for risk prediction. In evaluating the accuracy metrics associated with the test and in comparison to sentinel lymph node biopsy, we can see for the important metrics of sensitivity or identifying patients who will go on to have a metastasis and negative predictive value or those low risk patients who do not go on to uh, have, have adverse events, that this gene expression profile uh, had very strong accuracy metrics compared to sentinel lymph node biopsy and improved accuracy metrics overall when the two prognostic tools were used in combination. For the endpoint of recurrence-free survival, if we look at the, uh, if we evaluate those patients who had no negative disease, so these are patients that underwent the sentinel lymph node biopsy procedure and had a no negative outcome shown in the black line on the Kaplan-Meier curve, class 1A patients had a 90% uh, five-year recurrence-free survival compared to 49.3% for those patients with a class 2B outcome, indicating that patients uh, who are node negative could benefit from also understanding the, their molecular biology and the risk determined by the, de de by the decision DX melanoma test. You can see that within this group, sensitivity for class 2B patients was 61%. The negative predictive value is 91%, very high negative predictive value overall. Since the time of the meta-analysis, um, <clears throat> an important publication, an important recent publication, was the establishment of a clinical workflow for the Decision DX melanoma test by five expert dermatologists who convened vir virtually in May of 2020 and reviewed published literature on prognos uh, prognostic tools in melanoma. The group established a clinical workflow for dermatology to use gene expression profiling in melanoma prognosis, importantly within the AJCC staging criteria and in alignment with NCCN guidelines. Most importantly was their, their determination that the test should be used in a shared decision-making model as it adds objective information to help multidisciplinary care teams educate patients and make more informed decisions. In summary, the Decision DX melanoma test is supported uh, by the reporting of over 5,700 patients in studies uh, reported in 26 peer-reviewed publications, including two meta-analyses that have led to a level 1A evidence um, according to the SORT criteria. The test, which has been available since 2013, has been ordered over 59,000 times by over 6,800 clinicians and is currently covered by Medicare uh, and multiple private payers uh, based on the robustness of the evidence supporting the test. So we thank you for your attention uh, and remind you that Castle Biosciences has developed a robust molecular program to provide molecular diagnostic solutions for patients with dermatologic cancers. This includes three tests focused on dermatologic cancers, including Decision DX melanoma, Decision DX diff DX melanoma, and the Decision DX SCC test for patients with high risk squamous cell carcinomas. With that, we'll conclude this presentation. Thank you for your attention, and please reach out with questions uh, if you have any.